This week, we welcome Thomas Kinsella, COO and co-founder at Tynes, to discuss using no-code automation to tackle analyst burnout. In the security news, you like the browser so much, we put a browser in your browser. Hackers are using sock puppets. The patch that kills performance. Detect eavesdroppers. No more passwords. One-click account hijack attacks thanks to JavaScript. The return of Shikata Ganai. GIF shell, or is it GIF shell? Lexmark firmware confusion and searching for a long lost copy of OS2. All that and more on this episode of Paul's Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly for security professionals by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. FlexTrack is the premier pen test reporting and collaboration platform, empowering your team to spend more time hacking and less time reporting. FlexTrack centralizes your data, streamlines tedious workflows, automates report building, and facilitates communication with stakeholders. To learn how you can achieve a 30% increase in efficiency and cut report cycles by up to 65%, head to securityweekly.com forward slash FlexTrack. Claim your free month of FlexTrack and get your copy of the Writing a Killer Penetration Test Report Guide today. Right now, everybody is talking about cryptocurrency, and the cyber criminals are hiding in the conversation. Cyber criminals use social engineering loaded with urgency and fear to successfully prey on your company, your employees, and your customers. Spear phishing is just one of 13 types of email threats. Barracuda has identified these 13 types and shows you how you can protect your company, your customers, and your reputation. Find out about the 13 email threat types and Barracuda email protection. Get your free ebook at securityweekly.com forward slash Barracuda. That's securityweekly.com forward slash Barracuda. Tonight on It's Paul, a woman claims she can read the future in slices of pepperoni pizza. A young fellow from New York claims he can perform the fourth movement of Beethoven's Ninth on a bicycle. A couple who was married by Elvis Presley in Topeka, Kansas last week. The solid gold Asadorian dancers. And of course, Paul Asadorian. Welcome everyone to Paul's Security Weekly. It's episode number 755 recorded on September 14th, 2022. Right here in G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island. Dr. Doug White Hello. is in the house. I'm here. I, I, I'm here again. They call you Dr. Doug. That's right. Sometimes. Actually, you usually call me that son of a bitch. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On the lines remotely, Mr. Tyler Robinson is here with us. Paul, good to see you, buddy. Good Long to see you. To see. Love the shirt. Love the shirt. It's awesome. Look shirt. It says, <laughs> his shirt says woo-woo for our audio-only listeners. We'll talk about that later. Josh Morpet is somewhere with us. Where is Josh? I can't see Josh. Oh, there he is. Oh, right. I'm right here, man. What's wrong with you? Can't you see me? No, I couldn't. Oh. Now I, now I don't see you anymore. It's a shame. Oh. You got a really bright Apparently shirt on. Apparently I'm not on. worthy of a monitor. You got a really bright shirt on. Uh, top, nice. of the, top of the heap this morning. What are you going to do? That's right. Uh, quick announcement. Security Weekly listeners save 20% on InfoSec World 2022 passes. InfoSec World will be held September 27th through the 29th at Disney's Coronado Springs Resort in Lake Buena Vista, Florida. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash ISW and use the code ISW22 dash secweek20 to secure your spot. Now, secure it now. Thomas Kinsella is the co-founder and COO of Tynes. Prior to launching Tynes, Thomas worked on security operations teams at companies including DocuSign and eBay, where he experienced firsthand the amount of time wasted on manual security work. Thomas has observed analyst burnout and talent shortages, creating environments where teams are stressed out, overwhelmed, and frustrated. He joins us tonight to discuss why no code automation is the ultimate solution. Thomas, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. It's great to be here. Thomas, how'd you get your start in information security? Uh, I didn't really know what I wanted to do uh, in like college. Picked a reasonably generalist tech degree, which I enjoyed. I moved into uh, kind of professional services consulting, uh, where I worked on a lot of like forensics data analysis uh, and IT security, I suppose, uh, for a little while. And then from there... 
Yeah, so a lot of how to do things and how not to do things. Um, yeah, from there I moved into eBay where, uh, yeah, there was just a great opportunity to to join the technical investigations team there, uh, investigating large-scale criminal organizations uh, who were attacking eBay and PayPal. Uh, and then, yeah, got, like really dove a lot deeper into security then. Uh, we, at that point, eBay and PayPal were the number two and number one fished brands in the world. And we were dealing with just some, yeah, serious organized criminal networks tackling uh yeah talking our users talking our customers uh and yeah managed to learn like uh yeah just learn a ton uh working with some really smart people uh both internally and externally working with law enforcement and then from there yeah got a little bit more experience in a few different other organizations so yeah, it was like not intentional uh yeah when i started uh same as everybody here not a ton of people were thinking about security and were saying oh wow that's a really interesting career but uh, you know, as we went on, uh, and as I continued, it certainly became a lot more and uh, a lot more relevant. So, yeah, I'm glad I glad I, I ended up here. Sorry, Thomas, did you say you you worked for eBay? Yeah, yeah. So eBay owned, yeah, e- eBay, eBay owned PayPal, PayPal. So it was yeah. eBay and PayPal. Um, uh, so we were like eBay Inc. Uh, but yeah, we worked for them for a couple of years, uh, both in Dublin and then a little while over in uh, over in San Jose as well. Sorry, I missed that. My laptop monitor was going to going to sleep and so i had to change a setting in there because this is a new laptop <laughs> so that's but so but like back then protecting users of uh ebay and paypal i mean those were like the juicy target i feel like today we have a lot more juicy targets but like back in the yeah. day there wasn't a lot that many, as many accounts i should say that held uh opportunities for fraud right it because was, even yeah. like online banking was kind of still like new yeah, online banking was new. Uh, th- there were certainly some like large scale uh, attacks that were like yeah that that were occurring against uh, against banks, and there was a huge amount of carding as well. But the way a lot of people monetized uh, like usernames and passwords was through like yeah you know through compromising their PayPal account or compromising their ePay account. Uh, so any breach, we'd see like thousands or millions of credentials checked against eBay and PayPal. Uh, and then yeah, we just see tons and tons of phishing, tons of scams like there was people like buy a lot of expensive things online obviously uh, but you know people buying cars people buying jewelry uh spending you know tens of thousands of dollars it's a it's a ripe environment fortunately or unfortunately for uh for, for scammers to come in and then yeah when back then people were not quite as uh not quite as sophisticated not quite as aware of some of the scams and yet yeah, it was it was really interesting seeing uh seeing organizations um yeah, like criminal organizations basically target our users uh, and then figuring out ways to detect, respond, work with law enforcement for attribution and prosecution. It was a, a really, really interesting time. And eBay invested a huge amount uh, in it. Um, and yeah, learned like learned a lot and partnered with a lot of organizations. And it's gonna, it's interesting to see, you know, the the crew that were there move into a whole lot of different organizations as well. Yeah. Uh, how, did, how did the uh, how did the migration and and upcoming of crypto and even the attribution for criminal actors outside of uh, law enforcement's grasp? How did some of that kind of culminate as you were there? Yeah. So it was a little bit before a uh, little bit before crypto. And um, so there were a lot of people using like Liberty Reserve and things like that to like transact online, but it wasn't re- like blockchain. What uh, like Bitcoin was there, but it wasn't being used a ton by uh, by uh, yeah, but by, by 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 criminals at that point. A lot of the ways people, even with like ransomware and things like that, a lot of the ways people were doing it where they were saying, you know, like go and uh, buy two thousand dollars worth of money pack gift cards and things like that. If you got ransomware and like send you know, scratch off the the backs and send us uh send us the codes but yeah like for, for attribution ironically back then it was a little bit easier to get some attribution on folks people <laughs> a weren't as sophisticated and um, and b i don't think they were as as aware of like what was available online and also like people like you know paper or sorry people like paper people like um facebook hadn't locked down their platform quite as much to be able to search for uh, like using their graph API to search for you know users with particular email addresses or phone numbers. Uh, like Skype had a resolver where you're able to figure out what their IP was, and if you enter their email address, you'd be able to find out the the you know their user ID and then like resolve their IP things like that. Um, so yeah, like in in we actually we did a really good job, and we like it was it was very interesting like putting together profiles on uh, on the folks that were attacking us, like actually identifying them, and then like putting together reports and yeah, seeing them some of them get arrested. But as we kind of 
grew uh, a lot of like and had some great successes. But as you grew, yeah, some folks got uh, got a lot better at it, and there were some really really sophisticated organizations, some of which have been taken down, some of which have not. And um, that uh, yeah, that yeah made a lot of uh, made a lot of money, uh, like not just through three way, but through through various different uh, various different scams. But I, like cri- crypto, definitely. Um, I think some of the methods like that kind of, you know, w- wiper malware or like locker malware with those money back, that obviously like crypto made a big, uh, like a big impact on the anonymization. The way a lot of the cash aids worked even back then was through uh, like Western Union or MoneyGram. So yeah, if you made a, uh, you know, made a couple of thousand dollars, you'd still have to figure out how to get it, uh, get it back to Eastern Europe, get back to Romania, back to Bulgaria, uh, back to Ukraine or Russia or however. Um, and then same with, uh, I think yeah, they, there was you know an entire work from home uh, like money mule industry that like kind of got disrupted quite a bit by uh, uh, by the advent of Bitcoin. So, Thomas, how did you how did you balance like following the threat actors in that level of threat intelligence versus like maybe tracking their tools or you know actual like logs that you were seeing? Like how do you how do you balance that? You got to pay attention to all of it, right? But is it like a, a, a good balance? Yeah, so like so we worked really closely with the um like the incident response team, but my team's job uh was like specifically like find out the largest organizations uh and like work with law enforcement to get them like to yeah for, for attribution and prosecution. And then the second part of that was like then I de- like work with the incident response team to say like, hey, what are the measures that we can put in place mm-hmm. like using their TTPs to prevent this from happening? So like there was a like there were some obvious things like, hey, let's like take every single IP that's logging in on all these. Uh, let's see if we can identify uh, either a botnet or uh, a yeah proxy list that you know these are logging in from, and then we're able to um, yeah then we'll be able to like whatever bot like block IPs proactively, things like that were really, uh, really obvious. Same with like user agents and things like that. But obviously people will get a little bit more sophisticated. Mm. Um, you'd get really something good, like back then, like, you know, detecting phishing kits. Uh, again, like the, the techniques, I suppose, that didn't, it's not that they didn't, uh, they did like uh, some organizations were using them, some like, uh, like some companies were using them, uh, but Things like you know having a little bit of JavaScript on your homepage, so that if somebody ripped your homepage and they stood up a phishing website, you'd know immediately how to take it down. Um, yeah, when so you'd were be you able guys, to like, when were you guys doing that? Yeah, that was like back, like even like 2011, 2012. That wow. was like that was happening. Yeah, yeah so there's it was like really, a whole. There's like a. a I met, yeah, I met yeah. with at least one startup that that's part of their, uh, their yeah. solution. Yeah. A hundred percent. And then like there's there's a there's a bunch of other things that you should be doing, right? Like you should be seeding crowds in, seeing where they uh where they go. Mm-hmm. Uh but we even had more like uh yeah, like HTTP or fair headers or something that we started looking at pretty well. So after somebody uh logs into a phishing site, pretty often the phishing pay or the like the the phishing kit authors will just like redirect you to the legitimate eBay login page or mm-hmm. whatever. So if you look at and it, it's a lot of data, but if you look at um you know the the pages that redirect to ebay.com or paypal.com you will be able to identify huh that's uh that's interesting uh you know this we've never seen this url before we've never right. seen this yeah uh, first occurrence least before. least frequently least frequent occurrence uh it, that kind of analysis is still today exactly yeah and yeah, um, and then the other thing that you could do then is you you know like like go back you'd like see is there any directories open see like where they got pwned also do some like clustering analysis on those kits to figure out like hey uh you know what are like what are the most common ones and can you identify uh can you identify actors that are uh or like yeah groups of actors that are that are like either creating these kits and selling them or using them in a particular way and then identify those accounts taken over see what they're being used for it's really like it was yeah, it was sophisticated, but there, there's a bunch of startups that are doing doing some smart stuff, and in fairness, a bunch of academics that are doing some smart stuff as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it was really where yeah, you just learned learned scale, you know, like when yeah, when some like large like Cutwell, for example, like when those like when Cutwell started like spamming us, we'd go from you know receiving a couple of thousand reports a week to suddenly receiving you know 150 thousand reports of like you know PayPal phishing in a day, and now you're like ooh, now now we mm-hmm. have to figure out how to operate at a at a little bit of a different level. Uh, so it was yeah, it was really really interesting. <clears throat> and then you moved to DocuSign after that. Yeah, so um, 
I think at that point, eBay and PayPal were splitting and my I was working over in the US. My visa was with uh, with eBay Inc. And oh, I was going to ask that. So you came over here in, in that time and worked on a visa? Yeah, yeah. I, I came over and I like I loved it. Uh, but uh, yeah, my visa was with eBay Inc. And the vast majority of the like not not everybody but a lot of like i think the more interesting investigations were actually on uh on ebay but uh the like the vast majority of the folks saw the potential and uh the like the growth of paypal was where where it was at so they wanted to uh, they wanted to stay in stay in paypal so the team kind of split uh and it was clear that like hey that you know it's like a lot of really smart people say but it was still clear that like hey ebay is not the place that you want to you want to be uh so yeah i took an opportunity to to come back to ireland that's uh, interesting most join. of us have been through acquisition but not i feel like less people have been through an actual split because it happens yeah. much less frequently yeah and it's like it's really strange because you it's like like really like great learning experience but strange when you know people that were your colleagues like you know whatever two weeks ago mm -hmm. are now and not doing anything maliciously but very much not looking out for you know the ink industry, but rather, oh, right. well, actually, you know, I can't really share that information with you. And you're like, what? Like, yeah. it's in the we, benefit, like, it benefits both of us. We used like, to work mm, together. What happened? Much. Exactly. No, we don't work yeah. together anymore. Like, so. overnight. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, uh, but yeah, like, th th like, th there's, th th there were a lot of agreements in place, obviously. So it didn't, uh, it didn't hamper things. It was just mm. like, yeah, eBay's. And if you look at eBay's stock price and PayPal stock price, you can see why, uh, you can see why. Um, but yeah, it was like, it, it, such an interesting time we also experienced a couple of like large incidents in ebay as well as you uh as you can imagine and that was a that was a uh, you know an interesting time to see uh yeah i suppose to, to work with the incident response team and figure out like what was happening there so then yeah joined ebay um uh, yeah after a couple of years or sorry joined docusign after a couple of years uh it was just myself but there was a few folks on, on the security team but myself and uh Tyne CEO, uh, a guy that I've worked with for uh, almost 15 years at this point we were like the first two folks on the secops team mm -hmm. and then we grew that team to yeah, about 25, 30 people globally responsible for wow. your usual stuff like incident response, threat intel, e-discovery, fraud, forensic, security infrastructure, pretty much everything on the security side house that wasn't security side of the house that wasn't really compliance was like rolling into us. And that was when, you know, yeah, when we were going public and it was just a really interesting, uh, really interesting time. But also so wait, seeing... hold on. You started at DocuSign and there was how many people on the security team? Uh, there was like five or six people on the security team. There's two people on the security operations team. And then, yeah, that by the time I left, there was like 25 of us on the security operations team. So and, it was like fast, had, fast enough. Bro. And you had gone IPO during that time? And too? we'd gone IPO during that time, yeah. So oh. it was uh, good for it you, was really, It's It was a really it's, interesting time. I think it's time. hard for a lot of people to s stick with a company through IPO because a lot of changes are happening as you make that transition. Uh, it's massive, actually... it's Massive a, changes. Yeah. Usually, like they get a new, they get a new CEO, and the CEO fires all the executives and replaces them. It's usually like one of the first things that happens when a company is going to go IPO. Yeah, and like uh, like from a security point of view, there's th this is like a, a really interesting conversation to have with 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 a load of folks, and a lot of people have experienced it. But like all of a sudden, you go from you know kind of like hey, you've got your own program to you like compliance is obviously is obviously always yeah. really important. Uh, but now it's like every incident, the CFO, the like you know the chief legal officers, they're freaking out yep. because they're like now we have to you know be concerned that you're like that we have to report this to the SEC or report this to mm -hmm. markets. And like this, like this was this was happening, you know, several times over the last year. And now you're like only now you're taking it seriously. I thought that's a little bit harsh, but you know, it's a uh, it's 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 interesting. And then it's yeah, it's much like, easier to get on the front page of the Wall Street Journal as a public company. That's exactly. kind of the problem. That that's pretty much it. And then the, exactly the problem you identified there, uh, Paul, was that like people start leaving, mm -hmm. and now all of your stake, and that could be the CEO firing people, or it could be your stocks have vested and as a result you're like you know what i yep. uh like I, I, I was here for seven years i've done my stint uh and at that point like your stakeholders that you've been working with for several years honestly like they spend and i'm guilty of it myself like you spend the first couple of weeks just like looking at the stock price being like you know am i going to be able to you know whatever buy a uh, a car go on a holiday or is this like you know buy a house money and for some people like who are executives that's you know way more than that kind of thing yeah it's and, way more um, than buy a house money for the executives ex yeah exactly so as a result they're like it's not that they're checked out but there it's a massive distraction for the business and then you know when they I think there was another they podcast leave, that talked about like what's f you money like how much money is actually <laughs> f you money which means you can just like tell anyone yeah, to yeah. f you and 
and that's it. Sometimes it's FU money that they're making. So, you, you know, they're, like you said, Thomas kind of checked out. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And like, and look, if you put in your time for yeah. you, you know, spend whatever, six, seven years at a, like a senior exec level in a company that's gone public, like you, that's, that's why you joined the startup right. rather than taking, um, yeah, taking, uh, I, I'm going to throw it across Twitter money, uh, but like, it's why you joined the startup. So, mm. Um, so, but you also cut your teeth in the sock at DocuSign, yeah. right? That's where Sorry. it sounds, that sounds like it was the predecessor to yeah. like where you are now and really exactly, understanding. Yeah. I mean, you built the sock, you lived it through the sock and you saw the daily operations for, you know, like three years, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's, that was, that was it. Like we, um, we, like we were the two folks in the security operations team, but the security operations team were responsible for, yeah, incident response, threat intel, like get yeah, fraud. Uh, like we were there when we, yeah, like had, you know, uh, a very rudimentary SIM that was able to detect traffic to an IP address all the way through, you know, purchasing an EDR, or deploying your SIM, uh, like figuring out how to collect cloud logs and um, figuring out, yeah, like, yeah, what sort of threat intelligence you should be purchasing, what sort of, sort of, like what sort of case management platform you should be purchasing, how you should deal with automation. And yeah, just going from, you know, being unable to detect any incidents to dealing with, and not detect anything, like, it's hard to detect some incidents to dealing with, you know, security operations and incident response as a public company. So really interesting seeing that growth and seeing how, yeah, how things should be done. Uh, but also, yeah, feeling that pain, like seeing the team, like uh, there's such a challenge with every single security team or every, every single like SOC team now, which is that, you know, as you get better at detecting and as you buy a new tool, you have more to respond to. So the, the better you are, the more work you kind of have to do unless you start automating. And it was really there that we just felt that pain of like several incidents. Like we ha we were getting budget and we were doing a really good job. Uh, but yeah, we got we got really good at really good at detecting. And then it turns out that, you know, uh, like certain other folks weren't necessarily as good at locking down their like certain environments or they were just, you know, same as a lot of startups. Uh, yeah, like other challenges where you're detecting things like what, how is this possibly happening? Uh, so it kind of just felt like there was, you know, a sort of Damocles hanging over your head a lot of the time. Uh, and like, even though, even though we were like locking things down, there were still just like so many incidents coming in that it just felt, yeah, just like everybody was like, everybody was suffering, everybody was burning out and it was, uh, it was hard. So you're an adrenaline junkie and a stress monster. Yeah, pretty much. So I hold it on my shoulder. So you'll see me like hunched over and uh, like, yeah, like at night, just like, yeah, in front of the laptop. But yeah, like, it's, so actually there's a really, um, my, uh, I'm not, it's not like a little bit of an adrenaline junkie, but the, the um, my, my, during one big incident we had in, uh, in DocuSign, our CISO put up an interesting graph. So we got, we got hit uh, by some, uh, some, some, yeah, some malware and they, uh yeah basically we detected that like there was some 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 data out in the wild uh and it took us a couple of days to like track it down but it went from like hey we detected something uh we um yeah we detected something we like reported to our CISO we reported to like the like whatever C staff uh you know uh but the the CEO threw it and then all the way through literally like front page of TechCrunch um uh so yeah, we or she during the entire incident had her Fitbit on and it showed like her basically her heartbeat for like the week from like, you know, the Tuesday morning when we detected it first, you know, goes up a little bit uh, through, you know, briefing the CEO up a little bit more through like briefing the board up a little bit more, you know, down for sleep up a little bit more, you know, as we figure out what it is, what's happening. Uh, and uh yeah and like a couple of false stones were like yeah we've got this and they're like oh nope turns out that's just some other like whatever stupid stuff rather than bad stuff that's happening uh all the way through till yeah till when we have to make a public announcement we have to tell our customers and uh you know it goes uh you know front page of tech crunch front page of you know crabs all that sort of stuff uh and then yeah she's being interviewed in a bunch of different places but just seeing her stress levels and like her heart rate rise throughout the entire thing and then even like two weeks later seeing her like yeah her heart rate was still elevated like two weeks later it's like it really shows uh you know just how stressful incidents are 
Um, so anyway, I thought this was a, a great story uh, and like really, really interesting. So I bought myself a Fitbit and then during the next, and it was a, admittedly a much smaller incident, uh, during the next incident, um, yeah, I was like monitoring my heartbeat and then I like, you know, went home uh, that night and was like checking it out and my heart rate had just dropped. I was like, what? How did my heart rate drop during like a, during an incident where we're, yeah, like, you know, investigating something that's happened. And I, yeah, I realized that actually like what I'm stressed about is not so much the work or the incident, the incident, you can handle them if you're, you know, it's, it's actually a chance to get to, you know, use your skills, you know, your team are really good. The stress is not knowing when that incident is going to happen. That you're like, it's you're on, you're always on. You're like, oh God, something's going to happen. And like when that first alert comes in, you're like, oh no. But then once it actually you're in it, you're like, okay, I know what I'm doing here. I know that we have to like do X. I know I have to call Y. It's more of an operational function. And that's, yeah, I thought that was really interesting. So, so. What, what else about a, a SOC analyst is leading to all the stress and burnout, Thomas? I think there's a, I think so. There's a, there's a bunch of different things. And we did, we actually did a survey. So like we, we, we left, um, yeah, left like, uh, times now, like four and a half years old, uh, or almost five years old. Um, but yeah, we, you know, been out of it for a little while. So we, we tried to figure out like, was it, is the situation the same? So th- this like early this year, uh, in like January, February, we did a survey of about 500 SOC analysts around the U S and asked them that question, like, Hey, mm. what, like, what do you like about your career? What do you not like? What, what's stressful? What's not stressful? And it was really interesting. First of all, people are still like burnt out, but it was really interesting hearing some of those responses. And um, so some of the things that I, I suppose that I took away from it. Uh, like, first of all, they do really like their jobs. And um, so they get a lot of, they get a lot of value out of it. They feel respected. They feel like they're, they're doing a good job uh, and that, yeah, they're engaged. So I think like six, 70% said they're very engaged and 70% said, so they're very respected by their peers outside of the SOC. But what was really interesting then was, yeah, that like, I think almost 50%, 48% said they were very burnt out and another 20, 26 or 27 percent said they were somewhat burnt out uh and then when we asked them like hey what are some of the things that are stressing you out it was pretty obvious so they said like they've more work than ever their team is understaffed they have too many tools to look at uh and they're spending way too much time on manual tasks and um, this is all if you go to times.com slash sock um but yeah like wait, just wait way too many alerts not enough staff and then like having to like context switch between like 20, 30 different tools is really, really hard. Is it, was, um, that, was that your experience at DocuSign as well? Did that jive? Like when you re- read those survey results, you were like, yeah, like that's what I experienced too. Yeah, it was. But what, what, what I found, I, like I didn't think, like we were definitely respected and we definitely, uh, like we definitely enjoyed it. Um, and yeah, but at the same time, we were definitely burned out. I did not think that as many people enjoyed like, enjoyed life i kind of i thought that yeah more people would find it a little bit more of a slog or more people would find it hard and i also like kind of counterintuitively thought that as a result well in i i think it's counterintuitive that people i i think that they're very engaged and it, i think it kind of shows that a lot of people in security kind of think of it almost as like a it's it's a mission it's a vocation almost that like you're you know you've got a higher purpose of like we're defending the company or we're defending like another organization if you're working in an msp and um, so yeah it was really interesting so i, I guess I, I didn't quite expect the results but it definitely does jive with my uh mm. with my experience and the experience of a lot of a lot of the peers that i've that i've worked with and so the the survey was really about manual tools was that the no, the, the survey was really around, it was really around like, uh, like, get, like h- how the SOC are doing. So like what, like how, what, what it's like to be a, be a SOC analyst. I'm sorry, but like that, that was days. the number one thing that they were like, basically stress and burnout so, is because we got to do all this stuff just to get to the bottom of an incident, basically. Yeah. So we, so we, uh, we said like, Hey, what are, like, what is, what is the biggest challenge day to day? The number one challenge, uh, like when they say they have to rank them, uh, the number one challenge was being understaffed. Number two was time spent on manual tasks. Mm-hmm. Number three, poor visibility. Number four, poor processes. And number five, too many alerts. And then when so it was what frustrating, they, they need a single pane of glass, Thomas, is what. <laughs> so, well, I think <laughs> you, what can see why, they could... you can see why folks in your space use that term. But yeah, the fact that like in order for me to do my job, I got to go to like all these different places and do manual tasks to get it done. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's really, really, I, I don't know. I don't actually think it's like necessarily a single pane of glass, but yeah, it like, it is, uh, 
it is yeah definitely that there's like there's way too many alerts and that you don't want to have to like contact switch and yeah you you don't have the time to uh to do the fun stuff you, in in security you know do you think some of that angst or whatever you want or burnout or whatever is driven by there's so much marketing and so much stuff out in the industry saying ai and all this automation even though it doesn't really exist and and so everybody's sitting there in the sock having to do manual tasks going wow i really wish we had that but we don't and that makes sense yeah i do i yeah i i, I, de I de that definitely makes sense i think um yeah there's a lot of ai that's dressed up as a you know a, a silver bullet um to try to stop all your security problems when it doesn't actually uh well but, ai makes sense like there's, I, there's plenty I just of good get, applications I just get but nothing's a, a silver bullet i get people Pardon? saying you know like isn't there just one thing we could get and it would solve all our problems and you know and there's ads that say that but then so i think you're sitting there as an analyst and you're kind of going wow yeah. if only we had this if cool only we thing, had a single pane of and glass. i'm stuck here <laughs> yeah. doing this log analysis on my own and it makes you feel really lousy about like your job and stuff even though it's not mm. that realistic yep 100 percent but if like, so this is the set, kind of the next part that we, uh, the next part that we asked about is like, Hey, uh, like, you know, what percentage of time are you spending on manual work? And then what percentage of your job do you think could be automated? And yeah, that was really interesting to, to see. So it's kind of like, uh, as you're suggesting. So, uh, I think more than 25% said 75% of their job or more could be automated. Um, wow. however, and again, this is, uh, yeah, kind of towards what you're saying, there's a fear of it as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, like, so it's, yeah, we asked, say, hey, do you worry that automation will eliminate your job? And yeah, 68% said yes, uh, that they worry that automation will eliminate your job or your coworkers' jobs in the near future. So it's not just, uh, not it, it may not just be a, like a, hey, this doesn't exist, or like a, a utopia doesn't exist, but it's also that like, God, even if it does exist, this may not be a, this may not help us. But this I may think be really a, I think that's a good point for us to advocate for, like to be, I think really valuable to an organization as an employee, you should have the ability and the willingness, desire to train yourself and or automate yourself out of your job. That should be your goal. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and not only like the, the insecurity, we've such a, a staff shortage right now that if you have successfully automated yeah. yourself out of a job, congratulations, you've automated yourself into a much better job, or you can get hired in another company and repeat that process uh, for over you know twice the money. Over and over exactly, again. yeah. A lot of people make loads of money uh, doing this. The, the analogy we like to we like to give when when anybody asks that is like you know if you were a uh, if you're a hospital and somebody told you you know hey uh, like uh, your you know your your doctors your your clinicians they spend about fifty percent of the time filling out forms. Like, do you think that if there was some sort of automated system to like fill out forms uh, that the hospital would get rid of like half the doctors in the emergency room. And the answer is absolutely not. They'd be like, fantastic. We can provide a much better service to, uh, to folks and actually like, you know, spend, spend more time with patients. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, it's that it's you exactly that over and over and over again. Uh, you, people will be able to yeah, get a job in any other organization saying, Hey, this is exactly what I've done. It's like the best interview question, but more importantly, like the CISO, uh, or the CIO or whoever, the director of security um, will just say, yeah, hey, I, I want you to take on this challenge. How can you automate this? Or how can you, uh, how can you repeat this process? Yeah, I, I agree, job, Tom. It, it starts at the top, right? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Encouraging that automation in training. You know, I just gave a session. Uh, I, I, I presented at the EINS uh, Chicago Symposium yesterday, and I actually just presented a session on, on automation. Uh, security automation, uh, compliance automation, SOAR, uh, security yeah. orchestration automation and response. And it was interesting. I had people in the session from all different walks of business, uh, banks, uh, manufacturing, you name it. And it was interesting. I asked them some questions. I'm like, okay, how much of your job, how much of your department's job can be automated? And they're like, well, I don't know. So we went over some of the basic ways to automate stuff. And uh, I said, you know, just e even doing integrations where you're passing the information without having a human have to control C, control V. Okay. Because every time you get an engineer who's control C and control Ving all day, do you know what they're going to yep. be doing? Indeed.com. Mm. Okay. And they're like, oh, yeah, that'd be great. We need to keep our people. It's really tough to find people. Uh, and it 
And if you've got people who are spending time, like and highly paid, like it, security analysts aren't cheap, and especially as they get more senior and are able to understand the context of some of those investigations, they get quite expensive. And if you've got, if you're, if you get them, you know, copying and pasting an IP address into Virus Total and Abuse IPDB and Gray Noise and whatever other tools, like ten times or twenty times a day, they're going to be like, I don't want to do this. I want to spend time like threat hunting. I want to spend time like building out better detections, deploying some cool Yara rules or like tuning my SIM or even documentation, but they definitely don't want to be copying and pasting and then creating a JIRA ticket uh, with information about that and, you know, searching for uh, searching for duplicates. So they're going to do that for a little while. They're going to learn the context behind it and then they're going to leave. They're going to say, actually, you know what? I don't want to, I don't want to like stay in this environment. I want to, yeah, move to, uh, yeah, move to another, move to another company where, I, I don't have to uh I don't have to deal with uh, deal with some of this. So I think that's and that was that so was the very last thing. You kind of tee me up nicely. I'd love to hear what you guys think. So we asked so analysts and this isn't what this isn't that they are going to, but we said, hey, do you plan on uh, leaving your job in the next less than twelve months, less than twenty four months, less than thirty six months? Or I don't plan on leaving my job. So what percentage of analysts do you think said they plan on leaving their job in the next twelve months? Forty uh, percent. Any other takers? I'm going to go 55. How many? Wait, wait let's, let's be clear. Say it again. How many analysts plan on leaving their job in the next year? 12 months. Yeah, yeah. 12 yeah. months. Okay. Um, 12, 12 months is a year, Josh. Yeah. Well, I'm just saying like like next year or a year from now? With it, 12 months from the date. Within day, 12 they months from the data survey. Right. Uh, I'm going to say 70%. Yeah, it was 64%. So wow. really, really high based on like, hey, this work is too much. And even though they feel respected, even though they enjoy their job, that it's uh, they're burned out and don't uh, don't want to stick in that organization and think that they can get another job elsewhere. This was uh, earlier this year. So I know like the economic situation has changed a little bit. And also it's they say they intend on leaving their job. It's not actually I, saying they will. I realize, um, but I it's just pretty this interesting. Is, <clears throat> this is like a softball question now for you, but I didn't intend that when it popped into my head, Thomas. But how do you balance... The SOC analyst uh, time and resources, like they're doing a job, right? There's a lot of manual effort, perhaps, uh, in their job, and but they have to do their job. How do you allocate time for them to go build the automation and do the cool things so they don't have to do that job? It's the same thing with like uh, developers. I give this, uh, I'll give it that analogy quickly. Is that you know, developer is writing all the code manually, testing all the code manually. If only I could go automate some of these tests, I could write code more quickly and test it more quickly, but I had to stop writing code, implementing features and fixing bugs to go write the automations. That's always been a huge challenge for me, short of like infinite amount of resources, which none of us have. No, uh, I, w I think everybody would like uh, would like infinite of resources. So th there's th there's no easy answer, but the the correct way to do it is to like lower the barrier to entry to make it as easy as possible and as quick as possible to automate uh, those those tasks. So the reason we started Times was we did we looked at automation mm. and we said like we looked at a whole lot of different SOAR platforms, so that security orchestration automation response uh, platforms, and we didn't like any of them. We thought they were way too difficult, and worse than that. We felt that we felt we needed like to be developers in order to like build a connection or to actually like automate. You had said like know how to use Python. All or right. Know so how Thomas, to you and I are on the out. same page because I looked at and I'll name the vendor, but I looked at Microsoft's no code solutions and yeah, yeah. their like business suite application. Is it Office three sixty five? Is that part of Office three sixty five or is it part of? Yeah, AD? you can get what a license. Are, what, are, what do they call it? Because like you can do no code stuff. You can like build applications. You can connect your Microsoft apps together. And there's like a whole suite of pro products to do that. Yeah, there's like there's a, there's a bunch of different things they uh, that that they call it. But like Power Automate, I think is the big uh, is yeah. the, the Power thing Automate. That they're they're yes. pushing, yeah, yes. And I looked at that too. So now I don't feel so bad because I looked at that and I went, it would take me some time to be like an expert in Power Automate in order to automate those things that like I already know how to do and maybe have tried yeah. to automate with other tools. 
So you had the same experience I did. Exactly that. So we fundamentally believe that the people that should be doing the automation are the people that are closest to the work. So the people that know what that process should look like. And that is, fortunately or unfortunately, the person who is like copying and pasting Mm. the IP address into VirusTotal uh, and copying and pasting into Abuse IPDB. But instead, we make it super simple to connect with any tool. So you don't have to rely on any pre-built integrations. You've got templates over the left-hand side, or you can just copy and paste a curl command. Uh, Or you can use like a whole bunch, and we've got hundreds of pre-built examples that you can just deploy instantly. It's also, we've got a free community edition, uh, but you can just deploy instantly and like get started. You obviously need API keys and things like that. Yeah. Uh, but it like teaches you basically, yeah, hey, here's how you can get started really, really quickly. And the idea is also that like you should be able to get value immediately. So, you know, people always ask, hey, what, you know, what should I automate first? And the question is like, hey, where are you spending most of your time so right. that we can get rid of that and then enable you to spend more time on like, yeah, the more interesting, like actual com- company specific risk reduction efforts. And that doesn't always have to be automation. Obviously that could be building a better detection. Yeah, I get, but, I uh, get concerned yeah. too, though, that like now the user is the business analyst and the programmer and the QA person. But then I think about how crappy most software is today, basically. That has the benefit of having all those be individual roles. I mean, you can almost make the case that you get better software if you make the end user allow them to play all of those roles all in one. And also, like, just because it's a human doing the the work doesn't mean that it's not the exact same process, right? It's still, mm. you know, a human being the... Like the process or the QA person uh, and like saying, hey, this is, what, this is what my process should be. But also it doesn't mean that like you can't, so, so we're, you know, a super lightweight platform. But we also do allow you to like have, you know, dev and prod versions, have mm-hmm. approval workflows where you have to like, you can make an edit and then like move it into prod. Uh, and yeah, you've got like proper version control. You've got like, you know, uh, like uh, yeah, auditing and things like that. You've got the ability to, um, yeah, I suppose the, 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 the ability to alert if something goes wrong. I think the other thing to know is that, like, you know, we're competing against a bunch of automation platforms, but we're also competing against a whole load of scripts. And I think that that's <clears> a likely way of a lot of people that are, you know, hey, I want to analyze this IP address I mean, or I want to analyze be, this let's be frank, domain Thomas, or whatever. You're, com- you're competing you know? against Microsoft Excel, like the rest of us. Yeah, <laughs> and, well, like that's that's the original that's the original like low code no code platform, right? Yeah, that's like. That's what it was. That's what it was built for, and it's uh, it's incredibly powerful. We look at Excel as like uh, not not an inspiration for times, but I do look at Excel very fondly and say they're doing yeah. a lot of things no, right. True. You know, yeah, so, it you is, know, it's was... interesting that users okay. make the best QA team as well. Yep, <laughs> like, oh, most oh, of the just, time you just made me cringe. But most of the time, you're not gonna flesh out certain bugs until the users actually start using it and at scale. I mean, let I mean. Yeah, you can model all that stuff. You can automate tests. I think get most of the way there, but the users are going to find the bugs. Whether they report them or not is a different story. But you know, well, it's, I, it's... I do think you have to focus on getting them to report that. You have to have a mechanism and you have to ensure them that they're not going to come to harm if they do report it. Because we wrote a lot make of code. it easy for them to report. Yeah, we yeah. wrote a lot of code and a lot of times users were worried. I mean, I, I like what you're saying. The users did find things that we never thought of because right. they did stupid stuff that no, you know, sane or person they just, would do. They know their workflow no, better I know. than I'm, anyone I'm else. Just, I'm just kidding, workflow. really. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, you know, it was. You, but you had to convince them that they they easily could report it, and that the reporting didn't turn into yet another horrible repetitive task that they had to go through, and they weren't going to get called out on it. So you got. I think it's good to let them fiddle around and report things, but you have to be sure that they actually will, like you said or it will just sit out there and become another part of the task. Mm. And I've seen yes, that where, yes. where they know that this is going to cause a crash. And I've seen that almost written into protocol before right. where they're like, you know, when you do this, it crashes, then you do that and it brings it back up. But that's just how we do it. Yep. And you go, that's not good. And, and they're like, yeah, but that it's easier than fixing it. Mm-hmm. That's, that's- the same oh, with like fishing simulation tests, right? Where <laughs> a lot of people, or not fishing simulation, actual fishing, where people are like, oh, I don't want to report this, or I'm really reluctant to say, hey, I clicked on this link because I think I'll get in trouble. Yep. Whereas in reality, people are like, please do. I'm begging you to yep. report this. If you clicked on something, I need to know immediately, you know? So you have to have that culture of like, yeah, not blame, but actually encouraging uh, people to. But don't be punitive. It's, yeah. yeah. Yep. You know, it's interesting. I was at, uh, Mach 37, I'm weirdly enough wearing the shirt, 
back in 2014, and there was a, a startup there, at, which I think has since gone out of business. They were uh, using... Uh, oh God, no, no, don't tell me they were using no-code automation to solve the problems of no, the software. No, they okay, weren't. Good. <laughs> but what they were doing was, it was interesting, they were using a, a framework that was built for the U.S. government to actually, because they said, look, SOC analysts have 30 to 70 tabs open at any given time for one single incident, as well as their normal email and this and that and the other thing. So what they had was they had a framework that the, the government had, had built that would look for uh, like an IP address and it would highlight it in every tab you have open that has that IP address in it. And so it would, it would actually sort of help you align what you were doing. And no, so in a way, called, it that's, was... That's called polarity. That's called polarity. Thank you, Tyler. They're not. On a, they're uh, not. No, on a pre, Paul does a great job. It was pre-polarity. Um, oh. Well, polarity does that well. Just saying. Okay, no, that's fine. <laughs> we love Paul, but <laughs> I mean, it, it, in its way, it was its own. It was a low-code, no-code because it was a behind the, the behind the scenes to help you focus your work. And it's but but when you think about it, that was even that was. I still have to switch 30, 50, 70 tabs. Whereas what you're talking about is instead of that, let's extract all the data, manipulate it to where it's actually able to be put through a, a collation and a correlation engine, and then actually get some value out of it without spending the, the, yeah. the manual time. Am actually, I, correct? I yeah. mean, Josh is a great point. Like polarity and times would work really well together, right, Tyler? Yep. In, in your assessment, yes. those would be a, a, a match made in heaven. It is. It yeah, is absolutely. Single workflow that I probably could not live without mm. from threat hunting, incident handling, and even offensive capabilities. I use it day to day. Yep. I, we've got, yeah, we've got a, like a, a couple of different customers that are, that are using it. I don't think it's uh, like, we, we try to just be that automation engine rather than yeah. that, like that, I suppose that like documentation portion, but yeah, definitely. Uh, and, is anybody using times for stuff that's not security focused? Yeah, loads actually. So, um, so, so the, a couple of things. First of all, like when, when you build a workflow, you can share it with anybody, uh, or like other teams uh, in your own, like uh, in your own tenant, or you can like share it with, you know, whatever, with, with other customers if you want. Um, but yeah, what, what we'll see is, so like Tynes gets used in a lot of incidents, but we'll, what we'll see is that like Tynes will be used to like offboard users. So, uh, you know, whatever Paul's last day is next week. So on, you know, Friday at 6 p.m., uh, all of Paul's accounts will be deactivated. And that's the security team's job, even though possibly could be the IT team's job. The security team will say, actually, you know, we need to take this responsibility. And they will offboard, you know, Paul within three minutes because it's really easy to connect to, you know, a whole lot of different APIs, disable his accounts and, uh, you know, whatever, back up certain data if you need to or transfer their Google Drive files to XYZ. Um, and then the IT team are like, hold on a second, what's happened here? Uh, it took us, you know, like uh, two days to set up all of Paul's accounts and all of like Stephanie's accounts. What just, uh, you know, how did you do that? And they're like, oh, we use Tynes. And then Tynes will start organically being used by the, or the IT team for a few different uh, processes. But it's the same with like tech ops teams or DevOps teams or uh, yeah, other uh, other teams where like we've seen Tynes be used in like, yeah, incidents where the tech ops team and the IT team, or sorry, the tech ops team and the security team are involved, where like Tynes is just like popping up, you know, alerts into a channel saying like, hey, we just detected this IP. Hey, we just detected this. Uh, so there's yet yeah, like a bunch of different tech ops and DevOps teams that are using Tynes, but uh, it'll be for things like, yeah, hey, like this is an incident and it's a really easy to create an incident room in Slack, create a, you know, a Jira ticket, page the correct users, escalate to the right team. And it really is that the, the tech ops team are just like, like, how did, how did this happen? So we're not actively marketing to them. Uh, we're not like trying to, like, we're not, you know, uh, I, I can win whatever, 80% of the deals that I, uh, like the proof concepts that I'm with, with security teams. But uh, if I impair my, like, by the sales team to go out and like market to our uh, market to IT teams, we still need to like continuously lower that barrier to entry. But yeah, we've got a whole load of a uh, whole load of teams. We've got a great webinar with uh, with all zero uh, who are using us for or like in in the in the tech ops space. Um, but yeah, there's a whole load of like engineering teams, tech ops teams, DevOps teams, IT teams, uh, one or two HR teams that are using us. But in reality, we still we need to lower down the barrier to entry even further to get uh, to get those folks using us properly. And um, but yeah, like loads and loads of different. Uh, yeah, teams and a lot of people using us for just fun use cases as well. We're actually like, as a platform, we're pretty much just like we're just an automation platform. So we don't uh, we're kind of agnostic as to what your workflow is. Uh, the reason we're focused on security is that that's our background, and also security folks have very repetitive manual tasks compared to a lot of uh, compared to a lot of teams. Um, 
but yeah, as a, as a platform where we really don't mind what you're automating. So yeah, it's it's great to see times be used by those other teams, and it's a real like nice motion to get into other uh, other places within the organization. How do you manage and maintain the APIs, Thomas? I think one of the most challenging things for me and probably many others is when you automate something. Typically, you're using APIs in a sense of things like webhooks that are triggering an action and then interfacing with some other API to take some data down. And in the SOC case, probably creating a ticket, right? Like the end result is I'm going to interface with a bunch of this stuff, maybe act on a webhook. It goes, pulls data from this other API and creates a ticket. And those are conceivably three different APIs now that I have to interface with. As a programmer, yeah, I can go write that in Python. But it's a pain in the butt to, to write and maintain. I mean, it's not so hard to write. It's more the maintenance that I'm concerned yeah, about. So how do, you, how do you do that in Tines is like preserve some of that API stuff so it's not like, do you update that? Do I need to update it as a user? Yeah, so so it's, we, we we try to make it as simple as possible, but that uh, but yeah, in reality, there's there's a little bit of manual work involved. We'll never edit your workflows. Uh, it's like way too dangerous because I don't know exactly how you're how you're mm-hmm. doing it, but we will alert you if something's going to change. Uh, so if we think you know uh, whatever the Jira API is, well, the Jira API changes all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like if you know a new endpoint is being added and uh, something's being deprecated, usually you'll find out. Or if we don't find out. A customer will alert us, you know, the instant it's happened, yeah. someone or will alert us someone that it's going to happen. Exactly, exactly that. This when and then stops it, working, that you find out the exactly. API change. And then it's trivial for us to do a search across our customers and say, like, hey, uh, actually, it turns out that whatever company B is uh, is using this as well. We should let, let them know. What we the way we make it super simple though is kind of like what I was talking about earlier, uh, saying that you can like build a workflow and share it with another. Uh, with mm-hmm. another team, if you're building a workflow, you should be either grouping that or creating basically a global function. Mm-hmm. So we call them stories and times. So you should have a like a story to analyze an IP address. You should have a story to look up users uh, in like your Active Directory or your SSO provider or whatever your identity provider. Uh, you should have you know a story to block IP addresses or block domains or to you know pull a file from an endpoint or to you know whatever. Do, do 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 any different process. And the reason we suggest that is that first of all, then that can be called from any other workflow or any other story really easily. Just you save that and then you just drag it on, pass through the parameters and you, you know, one person can do the work. Everybody in your company can, uh, can benefit from it. But the second reason is that let's say an end point for, you know, virus total updates mm. from V2 to V3 and it starts deprecating V2. Now, in order to change from V2 to V3, you don't have to change your workflow in 20 different places. The only thing you need to do is actually change it in one place, uh, in that single API call, in that single story, and then change the associated like output that's being passed through to whatever the uh, to, to, to nor- nor- normalize the output uh, to to what it used to look like. And if you've done that correctly, it's literally like you know a 30 second job to uh, to change right. uh, change an endpoint. It's a little bit harder, obviously, if, for example, an, an API is no longer going to exist. So they're saying, you know, we're no longer giving you the ability to do X. Yeah. Um, you have but, to pay, yeah, pay us if, lots if, of money for that now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a, honestly a bit of a killer. And um, because uh, then we ha- we will just say like, hey, okay, here's you know a similar tool that offers functionality, but right. you're possibly going to have to like have you know purchase a license for this, uh, which gets you know get get, get well, that's not our responsibility, but definitely gets uh, gets difficult. But if you do it correctly, it's actually yeah, it's quite maintainable and quite uh yeah, like the the platform itself make, make, makes it really really easy to do. Um. That's not to say that so, so like you like it's not to say that everybody does it correctly uh, and like you know plenty of people will use an API in five or six different places but at the same time that's only five or six different places that you can mm. you know have to change one particular uh, you know one particular field in or one particular like you know URL in the uh, in the API call so it's pretty it's pretty easy pretty doable. I mean, you find developers today that. I mean, you still don't do that, right? Like, oh, I should ma- totally make that code a function, but right now I'm just going to copy and paste it because I have a deadline. <laughs> yeah, I did exactly that today. That. Yeah. So- <laughs> Shame on you. It should be a I'm function telling, or a no, method. No, it, was, it needed to be a function, and I was even like, it ought to really be a recursive, but, you know, I got I have to go do something else. So copy and paste. Copy and paste. <laughs> yeah. Whatever works. That's in like inevitably going to happen. We just try to make it a... Yeah, we just try to make, make it easier. And what you will find is... When that happens, the next time that they do have to repair it, they will be like, oh, I should probably create this as a uh, as a function or a method. Yeah. So. And, and when you're copying and pasting code, 
and it's Stack Overflow. Make sure you copy from the answers, <laughs> not the questions. <laughs> Now, I, will, I will tell what you, advice? I, I've had students send me that stuff and they're like somebody who's like, I would call like a, you know, a very early days programmer. You know, they're, they're really just flailing and you'll see them suddenly paste in some kind of elaborate C code yes. and you're going, wow. And then they, you know, they're trying to hedge and they're like, why does this not work? And I'm like, did you copy from the question or the answer? Yeah, and then I got <laughs> then I Google the the text that they put in, and, 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 I, and I go, oh, you yeah, you you uh, plagiarized the question from St Stack Overflow right. instead of the actual answer that was below it. Right, you're not dereferencing the pointer correctly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, C was uh, meant to be run, not read. It's a quote I read I, recently. <laughs> I would agree with that. Yes. It's definitely not fun to read C. Or, or RPG. Had, uh, <laughs> any more questions for Thomas? Honestly, it's kind of impressive stuff. Thank you. I'm going to be looking pretty hard, pretty hard at that. To yeah. Do some interest. To do some work. That's a very interesting. Yeah, product. more than happy to continue the conversation uh, offline, obviously. Um, but yeah, de definitely. And like anybody wants to check it out, as I said, like uh, there's a free community edition. So just go times.com, sign up, and uh, yeah. How a, does that? Yeah, how does that work? Of examples. How does that work, Thomas? If I uh, go there and I sign up for a free account, how how is is it limited and in like what uh, capacity? I'm curious to see what model you've chosen because this has yeah. been a hot topic throughout my career. When you have a company yeah. and you got a paid product, and then you want to have some either open source and or free trial product of some kind, how do you slice it and dice it? Yeah, so like we're we're security engineers, and even if our sales folks don't like it, we're keeping a free version, and it's like a community edition. It's free, free forever. The way we slice it and dice it is, you can sign up using a fake email. Address. Well, not a fake email address. You have to be able to like log in using it, but you can sign up using gmail.com. You can create your own Gmail, you know, yesterday, uh, and sign up using it. And yet, you get three free stories, uh, so three free workflows. Uh, mm -hmm. There's no feature limitations. So like free SSO. So I can like, um, I can automate the, the, I can automate three things. Basically. You can automate three yeah three processes. Three processes. Uh, yeah exactly. And um, um you're and hosting that instance in your cloud. Basically you spin yep, up so that's, for that's me. Exactly that. Yeah. So so self hosted. We're not going to give you a. It's a, the, the support is way 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 harder. We're not going to give you a. We're not going to give give you community edition self hosted. But yeah, you can you can sign up for three three processes. Okay. Uh, and yep, uh, just get started. Uh, get started immediately. Um. So. That's awesome. uh, there's a, sorry. There, there's a slight uh, like slight throughput limitation as well. So I think it's like a thousand uh, story. So a thousand flows a day, or two thousand like uh, you know runs of that story. So you could you know schedule something to run every five minutes, but you're not going to be able to schedule it to run every thirty seconds, for example. Yeah, because that costs you money in your back end cloud. Right? Exactly. And for a yeah. non paying customer, you don't want to be footing a huge <laughs> you know AWS or whatever whatever your back end is bill. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. AWS. So we don't we don't want to yeah, but we want to support you and we want to like help you help you get as much value and then like ultimately we obviously want to make a you know a business case so that you can right. you know do a whole lot more. But realistically, if you want to, and we've got loads and loads like uh, of customers that are yeah using the community edition and getting a ton of value out of it, uh, and yeah, more power to them. So. Do you, do you have a ton of people using this for, say, like uh, offensive capabilities or tracking uh, some purple teaming efforts, threat hunting? Yeah, so like threat hunting, not so much, to be honest. Like you you can, and especially like actually recording the results of, of, of hunts uh, and like creating like the manual tasks of like, hey, creating a ticket and stuff like that. Yeah, but like threat hunting, you you probably shouldn't be automating threat hunting. You should be taking a, like if you're automating it, then you're just like building, building detections. Right. Um, yeah. For some purple teaming. Yeah. A little bit. Uh, and, but, and like for a little bit of offensive, uh, but like, yeah, not, not really because a, it's our, like it's our infrastructure and B it's not very, like not, not, not very hard to like to fingerprint, uh, fingerprint times. Uh, the other thing is like, yeah, we're not like, we're not, you know, uh, we're not, we're not like Bloodhound. We're not Nmap. We're not going to be able to like do do a whole lot of different tests like that. We're not like we're more connect to a bunch of different APIs. Uh, whatever that process is, you can uh, you can do it. So there's actually a lot of people in like the AppSec space uh, that are using it, but yeah, just not quite uh, yeah, not quite for offensive capabilities. Being completely honest and transparent, obviously. Thomas. No, um, there's there's some interesting uh, use cases here that I'm I'm pouring through from some web app stuff to. To different automated tasks for uh, starting engagements that that have interesting things, especially with the webhook capability and API access. That's uh, very interesting. 
exactly and yeah like that the, the, honestly that's like it's it's kind of funny there's, there's a whole lot of tools that have like you know a real crappy integration with jira or service now or slack or whatever so like just being able to send to a webhook enrich in one or two apis uh and you know and hit any custom apis that you want as well and then like output to an email to slack to whatever jira to whatever you want we yeah make it super easy to do that so like whatever that manual process like starting an engagement is it's really really powerful so thomas i just have five questions left for you are you ready to play five questions with security weekly i'm ready yeah three words to describe yourself uh hungry um ambitious and kind if you were a serial killer what would be your weapon of choice a rope if you wrote a book about yourself what would the title be um hmm uh start small demonstrate value what is your favorite hacker movie? I don't know what my favorite hacker movie is. That's a hard one. I haven't seen that one. <laughs> <laughs> your war games, hackers. Yeah, I've seen. Yeah, so ha hackers, hackers, pretty good. War games, pretty good. I yeah. yeah let, 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 let's go for war games. War games. There you go. Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Um, Tom Hanks and Julie Roberts. Wow, that was amazingly fast. Did you hear that you question? Thought before? about that. Yeah. Did you think about that, or was that off the cuff? Uh, I'm real big fan. I'm actually a real big fan of Leonardo DiCaprio, but Tom Hanks feels like he'd be a better, uh, he'd be a yeah, better dad, to be honest. Yeah, and then Julia right, Roberts yeah. just seems like a pretty natural, uh, wow, natural choice for a mom, I suppose. That was amazing, Thomas. Thank you so much for appearing on Paul Security Weekly. <laughs> thank you so much for having me, folks. It was a real pleasure. With that, uh, we'll take a short break. Coming up next, the return of Shikonik and I and more in the security news. Stay tuned. <laughs> 